today is Saturday, February 25th. It's 9.01 a.m. and it's another Saturday morning. Griff, how are you? You know, I'm lucky. I have a lot of Starbucks points because of my job. So I'm kind of like platinum carded up there and I'm a huge coffee guy. But yeah. I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? Uh, man, it was a good week. It was a really busy week and it kind of went by super fast. And there was a couple of big decisions in there, some good stuff. Hey, Griff, got a got a good project going. Uh, not quite under contract yet, but we've got contracts sent over. So that was really good. And because of being busy this week, I did not spend too much time in Twitter or in Bitcoin. What are some of the things that have happened over this past you know week, two weeks? There's always a lot happening, but there I would say there wasn't a lot of major headline stuff ordinals have slowed down there have been like full blocks now like a lot of full blocks that have none of them in it so the craze has kind of died down uh i take note that zaps on noster and damus like on the test flight look pretty cool i personally don't have it so i'm kind of jealous but there is literally a function on a test flight for damus i believe that you can tip in lightning instantly on people's tweets or Whatever you call them on Damus, I don't know what people call them, but it's no, pretty no, cool. Nosters, yeah, like the ostriches or whatever. I mean, it is a fun, it is a really fun app, and I mean the fact that people will be able to share content and get tip directly with nobody taking anything of it. I think that's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, I don't know if that's like the future of social media, just because uh, obviously everybody's all ad revenued up, but. Hey, I mean, like it definitely opens the door. The Federal Reserve seems like they're is it, are they like colluding with banks? Is kind of like the notion that I'm getting that they're definitely restricting banks. La uh, Corey of Swan Bitcoin was debanked by Citibank as well as Swan, which was like really, yeah, pretty big news. He had like a whole big thread about LinkedIn took him off as well. And, and who is this? He's the CEO of Swan Bitcoin. I mean, wow. he is. <clears throat> uh, so, and he was debanked by Citibank, no notice, no anything. It was super unjust, obviously. Um, but yeah, that went down. Uh, it's definitely interesting. I don't, and like the, the Federal Reserve colluding thing is just that they put out a notion to basically tell U.S. banks, you know, federally insured U.S. banks, to be very weary of cryptocurrency. Yeah, it and was actually so, I think the FDIC that came out with that statement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just really unfortunate because cryptocurrency like this is the problem with the whole conflating crypto and Bitcoin thing or why it was ever allowed. Now, all of a sudden, they can go after Bitcoin through regulation of crypto, even Bitcoin, is, even though Bitcoin is not crypto. But who knows? I mean, Jason Low Lowry also speaking of considering we we're bringing on an author, he released his book. Um as I am getting better at reading, not saying that I'm a, you know, I'm a, I can't read or anything. I'm just saying I'm a, a meme guy, a video guy, uh, <laughs> as we were talking about before the show. Uh, I don't know how palatable or like how readable his book is going to be, but his thesis. Yeah, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I guess his thesis was it, it'll definitely be an interesting take on, uh, I guess it's power dynamics in Bitcoin, but. You know, that's yeah. super interesting. Obviously, like he's, uh, I think, like a pretty high ranking official in the United States military. So for him to write his thesis or his PhD on it, pretty cool. I mean, like it's it's been a thing that's been talked about for a while. Yeah. Speaking of authors, speaking of books, I know you have done the legwork here on getting a very cool author and a book at which I am reading everybody on the podcast and I will finish this book. I don't remember how I got connected with this guy. I think it was just it was just on Twitter, and I think I'd maybe seen seen him post something, or he he had posted something about his book or something, and I'd saw it, and so I shot him a DM and I was like, "Hey, bro, I'd love to read your book. How many sats you want?" And he was like, "No," he said, "Don't I, I, you don't need to you don't need to pay me." He said, I'll, "I'll give it to you. I'd love you to read it," and I was like, "Oh, sweet, thanks, man. I, I appreciate it." And dude. I just couldn't stop reading it because it's such it's such an easy read. And it's such a, um, you know, a lot of these things, Griff, you and I have talked about a ton that he talks about in the, yeah. in the book. Uh, but it's so good to, to refresh on some of those topics every so often. You know, we've got Jake with us today. And uh, here he is, Mr. Jake Leary. 
Welcome onto the show, sir. How are you this morning? Hello. Very good. Thank you. Bitcoin and exponential freedom. Yeah. And what is money is the first chapter. And so, like, I guess I want to ask you, Jake, like, what is money? Yeah. So money is just a tool to facilitate trade. A lot of people, when they get into Bitcoin, they, they miss this. And this is the whole point of Bitcoin. It's here just to be money. But then you'll get people coming in because, I don't know, maybe they're a programmer or they're into tech or whatever, and they want to change the block size. They want to speed things up. <laughs> you have to understand from first principles what money is. And, and money is just a tool to facilitate trade. Without money, you, you just have barter. I mean, uh, Warren Buffett goes on quite a lot about if I owned all the gold and I owned all the Bitcoin, it would just sit there and do nothing. <laughs> Which is just nonsense because it <laughs> what what he's suggesting is a society without money will just have barter. <laughs> how many Coca Cola how many Coca Colas are you gonna sell when you've got barter? You know, if, if if I want a Coke and I sell well, like my line of business is uh like fancy dress costumes, I would have to go to Coca Cola with some fancy dress costumes <laughs> and then go, We don't want fancy dress costumes. So what do you want? Well, hmm, maybe I want some like Italian food today. So then I go to the Italian restaurant. Uh, <laughs> you know, get some fancy dress costumes. Could I have some uh, spaghetti bolognese and carbonara? And it just goes on and on. So that's why you have money. It facil- facilitates the trade. I love the the double coincidence of wants problem. That because that's like. You know, you can't you can't scale an economy or uh, a civilization or a society past a small community if you do not have a money because of that problem. And I think it's also important that you note in the very beginning that money is the base layer of human civilization. Yeah, so it, it, it's both sides of every transaction. In a society where you've got trade, uh, which is the only society you can have where humanity advances, you're either buying or selling in the marketplace. Every time you do that, it, it's like a vote for what you want. Every single thing that happens in trade involves money. So if the money is corrupted, then everything that we do is corrupted. <laughs> and and you can, you can just follow it out from there. I think an interesting piece on that, and I forget where the example comes from, but if, if, you're, if the supply of your money is elastic, now you're measuring things with a rubber band. And it's, yeah. then, then it's like, well, how, how can you really accurately measure something if it's not a fixed, if it's not a fixed quantity or there, there's nothing fixed to it? Speak a little bit to, to that and, and kind of money as, as the ruler. And then I've got I've got another thought that I want to throw in after that. Yeah, well, in an ideal world, money would just be a fixed thing like a ruler. And then you could just measure like we do, or you'd have a thermometer where you can just measure and it works and it's fixed. You don't want your thermometer just changing what the units and stuff. You want a fixed unit, but because valuation is subjective, nothing is fixed in an economy, but you want your money to be as fixed as possible. <laughs> so you at least want that to be a fixed unit. At the minute, we're, we're, we're expanding the, the unit and then snapping it short and expanding it and snapping it. And then we're using this thing to try and value the other things that are also, you know, the demand for oil goes up and down, as well as this thing expanding and contracting. <laughs> Whereas mm. changing in the commodities or goods or services prices should be based purely or almost purely on the demand for that product. Whereas yeah. at the minute they're changing because the denominator is changing. Going back to money being the base layer of society again, they're all being valued from this thing that should be like a concrete block at the bottom but it's not it's like a, a yo-yo and uh, it, it, it just reaps ha- ha- havoc through everything else yeah absolutely so so one of the quotes in there from this chapter is money acting as a unit of account becomes a measuring stick for valuing goods and services in society absolutely it's exactly what we're talking about here um, another one of these quotes that i think is really good is that money uh, Money that stores an individual's expended time and energy well provides the holder with opportunity and a buffer against future uncertainty. Okay, so, so I want to break this sentence down because I think that this is such a good one and has a whole lot of good stuff in it. So 
First of all, money that stores an individual's expended time and energy. This is a, a big piece that Griff and I talk a lot about. You know, there's a million different ways to define what is money, right? But I think one of them could be time and energy, time and labor, right? Time and labor that we expend out in the market, producing value, producing what is perceived value, um, and us being able to store the the money that we are able to earn by expending that time and creating uh, in the marketplace. If we're able to store that in money, well, that seems like a good thing. And and then you you continue on that that provides the holder, right? Whoever is holding that money. The optionality, as far as you, you're not you're not pegged into one direction of thinking or one direction to move forward. You've got options here because you've got some stored capital, right? And uh, and then you finish off there. It also creates a buffer against future uncertainty. Man, if if you're sitting in you know call it you know February of 2020, and all you got is credit card debt, credit card debt, credit card debt, and you've got no cash on the side. Man, that might feel a little bit more scary than the guy that does not have any debt and has a bunch of cash sitting on the side, right? You've got options in that second scenario. Would you talk a little bit to that? What do, what do you think of, on this stuff? I mean, this, these are obviously your words. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you go really back to first principles and you, you pull money out of the equation and you just think, what are savings? Savings are basically like I've chopped a lot of trees down and instead of burning all the wood in one go, I save a bit to one side, but because we've got money as a tool, you can just save the money and then buy the wood when you need it. Uh, but if you think of it in that terms, it's like, would it be a good idea to use all of your resources now? And then every time you get a resource, just use it. And, you know, because mainstream economists call it hoarding. And it's like, oh, look at him hoarding extra food. You know, you wouldn't say he's hoarding extra food or he's hoarding wood or he's, he's hoarding a building to live in. Why is he not knocked the building down and redistributed the bricks? You know, <laughs> <laughs> because we're we're providing a, a buffer um, against against the future, and that's what yeah money as a tool is also useful for. How how else would you? So I expend my time and energy. I go to work. I provide three hours of labor. How else, without money, would you then keep that energy that you've already expended condensed into a unit? so that you can then take it, pick it back up, and then exchange it in the future so that when somebody receives it, they know that the energy has been expended. And then I can keep this expended energy and and, Man. and, and trade it Isn't on again. Isn't that such a strange question? I mean, and that's, and that's literally what we're dealing with every single day in society with money, right? Like yeah. you said, both sides of the transaction, whether you're buying and parting ways with your dollars or, or sorry, your, your money, we'll say your money, or if you're the seller and you're parting with some item or service for more money, I mean, what a strange deal where it's like, well, how can yeah. I how can I store my time and and the labor, the 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 value that I've added? You know, it's like what a strange question. You're like, oh, well, money is a good is a good answer. When you're talking like inflation and prices rising, you've also had technological advancements which have driven prices down, which have hidden a lot of the inflation. Does one hour of work still get you, does that money still contain one hour's worth of work? Could, mm. So if one hour's worth of work in the year 1900 could produce one bag of corn, say. Yep. But now we've got the technology where one hour can produce 10 bags of corn. But you say, well, my money used to be able to buy one bag of corn. Now it can buy one bag of corn. Therefore, it's held its value. No, it's not. It, it's not held the time and energy expenditure. And that's the way... Mm. Of, factoring in the technological uh, deflation in economics people use the term ceteris paribus holding all other things constant it's like that's just so far disconnected from reality because there are so many different moving parts right like you're saying earlier the money supply expanding and contracting but also the supply and demand of a specific market uh supplying and contracting uh it's like there, there's just everything's moving from all these different parts um talk a little bit about price signals in the marketplace and the significance that price signals have on how people allocate their capital. Yeah, so in a free market, we'll, we'll start from that assumption, people bring goods to the marketplace to sell and to make a profit. That Pretty much their only intention is to 
how do I take these resources, transform them, take them to marketplace, make the customers happy and make a profit? Now, without price signals, it's chaos. You don't know what the market wants. You could be on a, a diet today, like a carnivore diet, and then you could switch to a vegan diet. So although you keep spending buying steaks, 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 the butcher's getting these uh, signals from you. So you keep putting the price up, and then you go, oh, actually, I don't want them. I'm going to flip. Now, imagine the entire marketplace, or most of the marketplace does that. I'm thinking about price signal distortion uh, and distorting what you're talking about, the denominator, right? The money, if the money is being distorted, and the pricing is being distorted. Uh, what does that create for us in the long run, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> Chaos. <laughs> Chaos. The, the problem is, is like, you know, th uh, things like 2008, that is because you inflated the money supply. If housing was going up in a free market with a fixed unit, it's because there is more demand for housing. So building more houses is the correct thing to do. If the money supply is inflated, which then inflated housing prices, not because more people wanted more houses, just because we'd messed about with the denominator. Mm. And then that then leads builders, people in the construction industry to go, aha, let's get into the building business. There's a load of money to make because people want houses. Yeah. And then they make all these houses and then you realize, oh, the demand is not actually there. Ludwig von Mises explained the crack up boom. It was basically if you inflate the money supply, it has to reset to the base unless you inflate again. But each inflation has to be slightly larger than the last inflation. This money's worth nothing. Yeah. Now, when when that will be, nobody knows. <laughs> the last topic that's really talked about in this first chapter, and that is good money and bad money. Uh, and you talk about it, you, you kind of talk through a little bit uh, about what good money, bad money is. And then, but you spend, I think, I think the main point on this was kind of the network effect of a good money. Um, you know, if, if this money is bad and it does not store my value, it does not make it more efficient for me to use and transact in the market with that money. Well, then I'm just going to use a better money, right? I'm just going to use the best money that I've got access to in wherever I live, right? If you spend all your day working and then you accept bananas for your wage and then you decide to put your bananas in a vault they're going to go rotten and then all of your <laughs> expended energy was for nothing whereas if i get paid in gold bars i put them in my safe and i go back in a month's time and the gold bars are still there and then my economic um, well-being keeps on growing and yours just keeps diminishing now it's up to you at that point do I just keep destroying my life and just working for absolutely nothing and starving and living destitute? Or do I copy what he's doing and start getting gold bars and putting them in my safe? Now, at the minute, it's easy to hide 2%, 3%. I mean, even at 10%, people are starting to wake up. Now, imagine if they're losing 100% a year, people start looking and they start going, oh, you know, look at Nick, he had that Bitcoin stuff and look how well he's doing for himself, you know, and then they say, oh, what's this Bitcoin? And then maybe I'll get some of that. So money as a whole, and it can take some time, <laughs> will always, the best money will always win out because humans are self-interested beings. When you're saving, you're allocating your, your savings to a tool that you think will store store your energy well, and which then over time sends people to the best tool for the job which historically was gold uh people settled on gold and silver and then gold and then now we've got bitcoin and it's only a matter of time before people figure out that the best we've engineered a tool for storing your time and energy expenditures so i want to leave everybody with with this thought on chapter one here if someone were to invent a new money, a new form of money, it would probably make sense for it to be digital, open source, decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, and have a fixed, immutable, and programmable supply. Jake, thank you for coming on with us, man, and, uh, and chatting a little bit about uh, chapter one in your book, uh, and that is Bitcoin and Exponential Freedom. Uh, Jake, where, is, uh, where, where can everybody find your book? If they want to go get your book and, and give it a read, Where's the best place for them to find it? And we'll put the links down in the description as well. Yeah, so it's on Amazon. So you'll be able to find it by just searching the title. Uh, if you type in www.bitcoinexponentialfreedom.com, 
There's three PDFs on there. It's available in English, Italian, and German at the moment. Uh, you just click the link and it comes up like a Kindle book. I've got it on Amazon as well. Griff, do you yeah. have any last thoughts? No, I'm excited to read the rest of it. It was a fun read. And honestly, just your thoughts on everything make me want to read it more. Now that I know the person who wrote it. It's really fun to hear people talk about money this way. When this is how I've felt about money for a couple years now. Not like maybe not even the longest. But it's good to hear people from, you know, people who are writing books, literally trying to tell the world, hey, like, bad money is not good. We're not going to be able to survive on bad money forever. Everybody needs to wake up a little bit. So it's nice to have somebody on the podcast who feels the same way from time to time, you know, other than just Nick, because then maybe we're crazy, you know? So I feel like <laughs> we're less crazy after doing yeah. a podcast like this. For sure. Well, Jake, uh, appreciate you jumping on with us. Why yeah, is, is gold money? Okay. So chapter two is going to be good. I'm excited about that one. And that one's a little bit longer and has a little bit more information that's going to be a good one. We're going to have to pick out some good topics on that one. So I'm excited about that, Jake. Have a great week, man. We'll see you uh, next time you're on. Appreciate you coming. Peace. Yeah. Griff, how about that, man? How about chapter one? What is money? Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, and I just really like his thoughts. I like his thoughts even more than the book, which is maybe why I like podcasting so much. But I will yep. read the next chapter because I like his writing style. It was good. It was a really good find by you to have him on um, because well, that's kind of the beauty of Bitcoin. There's a lot of stuff in the weeds. Like not all the stuff always is like the most followed or like not everybody knows about it per se. But sometimes the best stuff is, I don't know, very much like the best restaurant or the best food you ever eat is typically kind of like a hole in the wall restaurant, so to speak. And it's not always the five star Michelin, whatever. And that's kind of what I would compare uh, Jake to currently because like he, his following is a little bit smaller, but his writing is fantastic. So it kind of just always doesn't add up. But yeah, it was awesome to have him on. Fun deal. Hey, if you guys are not watching us right now, we've got video on Spotify and on YouTube. Also, come see us on Twitter at Nick and Griff Show. Get your Satoshi Saturdays gear. Get your Nick and Griff Show gear at the Satoshi Shop. Link's down in the description for that. <laughs> Satoshi Saturday is always a fun time. This week's going to be a great week, and we'll see you next time. Peace.